I'll be asking Mark McGuinness about sharing power with the First Minister. I have a working relationship with, uh, with Peter. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in the position of Deputy First Minister for seven years now. And uh, it all started with the relationship with Ian Paisley. And uh, to the surprise of many people, Ian Paisley and I had not just a good working relationship, we had a good personal relationship which has existed to this very day. And I wonder did people in the DUP like that? Well, I mean, at, at the time that <coughs> Ian Paisley left as First Minister and uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of people within unionism outlining the reasons for that. One which was cited was his age uh, and the other that was cited was that uh, people at important levels within the DUP didn't like the uh, friendly relationship that he and I had. Do you think that's part of why they got rid of him? Well, that was cited to me as uh, w one of the reasons why he had to go. Now, I don't know if that's accurate or not. The reality is that in the aftermath of that, there was uh, you know, quite clearly a, a decision taken within the DUP that they shouldn't be seen to be getting too close to Sinn Féin. Do you care? Oh, I, I do care because I think that a, an essential phase of the whole process of conflict resolution is the importance of reconciliation. Uh, between political opponents and between, uh, you know, everybody within our community. But Martin, uh, Peter, uh, Peter uh, doesn't need to like you, he just needs to work with you. Well, I, I'm not saying I dislike Peter, and uh, I don't think Peter has ever said he dislikes me either. I think we, we've always had, I, I think, a very civilised and cordial relationship, a, a working relationship. Correspondents and political commentators are saying that you're not talking to each other at the moment, that it's never been more toxic. Well, that's total nonsense. Uh, there has never been a day, either in this building in Stormont Castle or Parliament buildings, where Peter Robinson and I haven't spoken. Can you trust them? Well, I mean, f prior to the uh, decision of Maze Long Cash, I, I, I met with Peter a couple of days before that, before he went to the United States on his holidays, which he was absolutely entitled to do. And as far as I was concerned, the project to build the Peace Building and Conflict Resolution Centre was uh, still on the agenda. And then, uh, out of the blue, uh, a letter comes from uh, uh, the, the States. Uh, I'm not contacted, I don't get a telephone call to say that uh, the plug has been pulled on the project. So, from, from that perspective, uh, I'm obviously very wary it's a pretty fundamental question, so I'll ask it again. Do you trust him? I, I don't trust him in regard to that particular issue. Apart from that, it's no secret that there was a, a major difference of opinion between him and myself in relation to the attitude of the DUP in relation to the violence that was happening on the streets, the attacks that were happening on the police and uh, the threats that were being made against uh, isolated communities. And you know exactly what they will be saying, and many unionists in the country will be saying, they'll be saying they're not going to take any lessons from you about violence. Well, I mean, I, I think I'm glad you asked me that question because, you know, they went into the government with me seven years ago on the basis that we were looking to the future and not the past. And, and I know that there's always a danger if, if I speak out against things that are happening on the streets in the here and now, that my past will be upcast to me. You'll be accused of being a hypocrite. Like, well, well people, people will accuse me of being a hypocrite, but they will be they will be how can you, how can you, how can you accuse anyone of supporting violence when you did it for a lot of your life? Well, you see, the, the line on conflict in this country was drawn when we had the Good Friday Agreement. And I have since negotiated all our agreements with the DUP, particularly the uh, St Andrews Agreement and the Hillsborough Agreement, which saw you know, fundamental changes to Republicans' attitude to the use of violence here in the North. As far as I'm concerned, violence, conflict of any description was a no-no. Our duty and responsibility as politicians was to stand up for the agreements that we made. I made an agreement that I would give 100% support, but not uncritical support, 
to the PSNA in the context of the changes uh, that took place. And for that, I have been threatened with death by so-called dissident Republicans. My home has been attacked. My wife has been verbally abused in the streets by these people. But I have stood up and no one can question my commitment to the uh, to supporting the police or to the protection of the peace process and the institutions of which I am a part. I'm not sure about that because I can put questions to you about that because I wonder were you found wanting recently when Jerry Adams was arrested because I saw you standing yeah. on the platform. I saw Bobby Story. Uh, how dare they touch our leader? I saw you smiling. I saw you clapping. That they would dare touch our party leader. They're the leader of Irish Republicanism. I saw a press conference in which you know some people read out of your comments that you were maybe going to withdraw your support for policing. So you can be questioned. Uh, it's not an unwavering support for the PSNI. You were tested. Well, w one how of, dare they touch our leader? What, what, how dare who touch our leader? Well, uh, the they authorities, were, the police. They, they weren't my words. Uh, let's deal with what Did you I, not clap? Let's deal with what I said. You clapped. Let's deal with what I said during the course of the press conference. And you mentioned some people said, you were one of those people that said, that I had said during the course of the press conference that Sinn Féin would withdraw support for the police. That was never said during the course of the press conference. So there was never any suggestion during the course of the press conference that we would, why, why would we withdraw support from uh, an organisation that we were very much instrumental in bringing about in terms of the negotiations that brought about the new beginning to policing. It just wouldn't make sense. Let's come back to the, the, the current situation up here. You read some of the, the public comments from Peter Robinson about you. For example, in recent times during the, the Muslim controversy, um, he said about you, he said, I won't take lectures from a self-confessed leader of a bloody terrorist organisation on equality, tolerance and mutual respect for all. So, you know, how could the public read anything into that other than this relationship between the two of you is anything but workmanlike? He's not taking lessons from you on equality, tolerance, mutual respect, so what's left? If Peter felt that way about me, then I don't understand why he was involved in discussions with me about how we build together a united community. So. I just thought that that was an attempt to deflect attention from the remarks made by Pastor McConnell and the way in which Peter handled that. If I was listening to just this interview and didn't understand the bigger picture in Northern Ireland, I would think that you and Peter were sitting here having wee buns every day. You're at loggerheads over education. You cannot make it work together. You cannot find agreement. You're at loggerheads over welfare reform. You're at loggerheads over the Ardoin issue. You're fighting with each other every day of the week. I'm not at loggerheads with the DUP and welfare reform. I'm at loggerheads with the British government on uh, what's called welfare reform. Come on, we've got devolution this is in a, Northern Ireland. No, no, hold on we've a minute. We've got it here. But it's your responsibility to the DUP. Let me make this point because I think this is a very important point. David Cameron has now been uh, British Prime Minister for almost uh, four years, around four years. Sinn Féin as a political party has never had one meet with David Cameron. How many have you asked for? Countless meetings over four years and he has resisted doing that. He was found out recently and, and I found him out in terms of uh, uh, the fact that private meetings were taking place uh, with the DUP. Not a private meeting, private meetings were taking place with the DUP. And I wrote to him about two weeks ago, very critical of his uh, lack of engagement in this process. What did you say to him? Well, I, I criticised uh, his stance on welfare reform. I criticised his disengagement from the Haas process, the fact that the British government, whenever Haas came out with its proposals, didn't support the Haas proposals. And of course, I, I said other things in the letter. And I've since had a communication uh, from uh, uh, David Cameron that uh, he has now gone for the first time to meet with uh, Jerry Adams and myself. When? I think that's very, well I think it'll happen very very soon. For a British Prime Minister to, not to have met Sinn Féin for four years I think was a terrible mistake. What do you think has changed his mind? Hopefully now will be correct. Because I publicly criticised him. Because I said in the United States of America that I had met President Obama 
uh, more often in the White House than I had met with the British Prime Minister. So do you think he's been shamed into it? Oh, I think he, he, he obviously recognises that he's vulnerable on the issue and it's significant that the ag agreement now from Downing Street to meet with Jerry Adams and myself has come in the aftermath of my exposure of the private meetings that were taking place with the DUP and then that begs the other question about what, what were these meetings about, particularly as we are now less than a year uh, before the next uh, British general election and of course uh, the, this place in the north of Ireland was you know, we had our problems many, many years ago whenever the Ulster Unionists had nine or ten MPs at Westminster. John Major was the uh, British Prime Minister and the peace process didn't move forward because he was dependent upon those votes. If we are going to find ourselves in a scenario where David Cameron's strategy is being dictated by trying to get the votes of DUP MPs at Westminster, I think he does a grave disservice to what is widely seen as one of the most successful peace processes in the world today. Well, you're a strategist. You know that the election next year could be very close mm -hmm. and you know that Cameron might need the DUP MPs. You know it. Yeah, I think he also needs the peace process and he needs the peace process to work and he needs to play his part on that. And well, that's not in jeopardy, is it? He has not played. No, the peace process, in my opinion, is rock solid. So, but so therefore, what what's, what's your leverage what to is, Cameron? What is, in jeopardy, what is in jeopardy is how we move forward to what I think is an essential stage of the peace process and that is the reconciliation stage. And we'll move on to one of the, probably the biggest issues facing us in Northern Ireland, the past. And uh, how do we reach compromise with each other, all of us living here? Sometimes leadership is about that personal leader being seen to do something. Yeah. Peter Robinson made a personal apology. Hi again, great to see you. Yeah. Do you think it would be well received if, if you made an apology finally to people for what you did in your past imagine how the well, unionist community would receive that imagine how they would look upon that if you well, said the time's right for me to well, say well i sorry. think I, th I think i've i've done a, a lot of things over the course of recent years have you done that which have uh, well let me put it this way in terms of the, the past i am sorry for the people who have been hurt as a result of the conflict Many people have commented about what it's like to be in a in a room with you. I've heard lots of them say that you're you um you can be charming and you can be disarming. And I would I would quite like to get to know just how sorry you are, genuinely. And I'm not talking about for everything that's happened in the past. Mm. So for what you have contributed to in your past. And, and the victims that you, that you played a part in creating. How sorry are you? Well, well I, I think personally, you know, sorry, you personally, sorry can be a hard word for people to say, and I've already, you know, said that to you. But how sorry and are it, you, Mark? It can also be uh, easy for people to say, and it can also be very insincere when it is said. Which is the purpose of my question. I would prefer, how sorry are you? But I think I think I would be prefer to be judged on the contributions that I have made to resolving this conflict over the course of over 20 years. Sh sure. I, mean, I, I was Sinn Féin's chief, nego chief negotiator in the Good Friday talks. Yeah. I was Sinn Féin's chief negotiator in the uh, St Andrews but talks. Let the I was Sinn Féin's chief negotiator in the Hillsborough talks. I'm the chief negotiator that dealt with yeah. things like getting the IRA to call a ceasefire, getting the IRA to put their arms beyond use getting support for the police. I think that's how people are judged. They're judged on the contribution that they've made Fair enough. as opposed to the words that they say. Fair enough, but that's Martin McGuinness, the politician, okay? Yeah. The purpose of my question is to allow the electorate and every citizen in Northern Ireland, because you're at the top of government here, to look into your eyes now and understand Martin McGuinness, the man, the individual, yeah. the person, the human being. Yeah. How sorry are you? Well, how sorry do you want me to be? I want you to be as sorry I, as you are, well, as you genuinely are. I think What's that my, in your heart? My, my contribution to the peace process clearly says to everybody that I believe that conflict should be a thing of the past, that the conflict that existed was terrible, that it was awful, and it was awful that so many people from all sections of our community suffered as a result yeah, of it. You're, you're and I have dedicated I have dedicated my life 
to changing all of that to such a point where my life has been threatened. Uh, am I prepared to die for the peace process? I'll die tomorrow morning for the peace process without any fear whatsoever. The things that you're sorry for, do they trouble you? Do they actually get to you? Well, individual situations don't trouble me. What troubles me is that we were all part of a conflict and that was very troubling indeed. Finally, Peter Robinson, there was speculation about when he's going to go and when he's going to retire. How long have you got? Well, I mean, I've always said that, you know, the, the great passion in my life is the success of the peace process. And, you know, the peace process isn't over. The next stage of the peace process is reconciliation. I think I've been involved in important acts of reconciliation. Uh, meeting the Queen two years ago in Belfast, meeting her again uh, at Windsor. Uh, the way Do you enjoy Windsor? Well, a, a joy is not the right word. I mean, uh, how would you have liked to be thrust up in a white shirt with tabby bows and Do I get all it? sorts of tails. Well, you might fit it now, given that you've been so successful <laughs> over the course of the last. Did you feel comfortable with that? No, I, to be quite honest, I mean, I would say there was a lot of Republicans who probably didn't feel com comfortable with, with me being at the banquet. I think that you know, symbolically, big acts of reconciliation are very important. So long have you got? What do you give yourself? Or five years? Could you stick it that oh, way? I, I, I'm, I'm going to continue to contribute to the peace process. I mean, uh, I have uh, no thoughts. Now you are ducking this question, aren't you? I, I'm, I'm not ducking You must have question. a time scale when you'll go out and walk your dog more. Well, I, I'm looking forward very much to, to fly fishing on, on a regular basis, which I, I don't uh, manage to do because of the, the challenges of, of this job. No, I think it comes down to your health. It comes down to your family. It comes down to the health of your family also. I mean, uh, I don't know how my wife has stopped me for, we'll be married 40 years in, uh, in November. She probably sticks you because you're never there. Well, for me, she's a saint, you know. I'm 64 years of age, just passed. I'll continue on until uh, we, we see the sort of progress that I think the vast majority want to see. Now, I, I, I think also I, I have to say given the events of particularly over the course of the last 18 months. You know, things have been a big disappointment here. I mean, there's nothing normal about uh, the institutions. You know, I've, I've, I've spoken in the past about the fact that at the Assembly, and it comes back to the point I made earlier about Ian Paisley and about the reasons why, one of the reasons which was proffered to me as to why they moved him as First Minister. You know, I, I still meet DUP MLAs who won't even look at me. Who won't even say hello? Who? No, I'm not going to name any individual, but there's a right amount of them. The reality is that, uh, is that th there are still some people there who think that in order to uh, uh, ensure that they have uh, a mandate that will support them consistently, that it's much better to be uh, in conflict and in confrontation than in reconciliation mode. I'm in reconciliation mode, but, but Stephen, I can't do reconciliation myself. There isn't a day that passes that Peter Robinson and I don't talk. Now, against all the odds, against all the odds, I've been in government now for seven years in the office of First and Deputy First Minister, first with Ian Paisley and now with Peter Robinson. I think that's, uh, that's an achievement of some sort. But, you know, good work, but there's a, an awful lot more to do. And those trips up from Derry every morning you've got the radio show to listen to, of course. You still uh, shouting I, at the I, car? I, I, well, I, I've come, become very philosophical about this guy, Stephen Nolan. Uh, I, I think at the, at the beginning he was outrageous, but he, it seems to me he's, he's made a bit of an attempt in recent times to be, uh, to be a bit fairer. I think it comes with losing all that weight. Martin, thank you. Thank you.